Dr. Slondark asked me to talk about melanoma when it goes to the brain, so it's not going to be a uh, information dense thing. It's more uh, uh, speaking to your heart about this serious problem. Um, hence the title. So I think what we want to do is have hope, and hope that's reasonable, and we have that. And we want to have freedom, right? We want to have freedom from cancer, particularly uh, when it goes to your brain. So I think that uh, cancer and diseases of the brain are the biggest challenge for this century medically, right? The two really difficult things. And, you know, if you had to have cancer in your brain, it's really nasty, obviously, because that's where you are, where you live. That's what makes you a person. So I just wanted to um, give you uh, four numbers. And by the way, you should interrupt me, because I know, you know like we have this little idea of what we want to say, but it doesn't matter. That's just a way to get going. But I just wanted to give you four numbers. So uh, 10,000, 5,000, 303. So at least in 2013, about 10,000 patients died from melanoma. But half of those patients had uh, brain metastasis. So it's a really, really common problem. And it's a huge problem. And uh, 300 is the number of patients that have been put on clinical trials so far with brain metastasis, or they've had trials specifically dedicated to that. Um, and number three, the table. Next is that there's really only three clinics in the world that I know of that are dedicated specifically to the problem of brain of melanoma when it goes to the brain. And uh, this is one of them. So, to be uh, vague, I'm not vague, but I'm giving a context because the, there's been so few patients that have been put on clinical trials that a lot of what we say is opinion, right? Uh, not sort of data. So we're trying to change this and get people together in one clinic that really understand the brain. It sounds obvious, right? It sounds like, why am I telling you this stupid thing? Because it's obvious that you should put people in a clinic that understand melanoma and people that understand the brain and have a scientist really involved in doing this. And we have that here. So Henry Ford, Concentrate. So I think we need to think about how we do things. So Henry Ford thought about how to do things and as became obvious, wasn't a perfect person like the rest of us, but instead of thinking about just building a better car, he thought about, you know, how do you build the car? And developed the assembly line, that I think was the second major technological development in the Industrial Revolution, so that generated incredible wealth incredible prosperity and incredible improvement of quality of life for people because now you can get medical devices that are made in an assembly line, they're affordable, otherwise they cost a fortune. Drugs that Dr. Smalley talked about, these are made on an assembly line to increase quality and to make them, they're still very expensive, but to make them uh, accessible. And this is uh, Mr. Page and Mr. Grin who at Stanford trying to figure out how to get all the information off the internet. So they didn't focus on the information. But how do you organize that, right? Because now we live in a, as you know, if you have cancer, just going on the internet, my God, you get this fire hose of information. But they took this idea about how to process and organize the internet and made Google. So they changed things. So we want to have the same way of changing the clinic, which again, doesn't sound like a big deal. So Dr. Smalley, who just left, gave a great talk. But he's, for example, we can't find someone like, you can't invent someone like him because he's really interested in patients. Not just test tubes. I mean, he loves the test tubes and the structure and all that stuff, but you can't make people like that. Dr. Kushalani who spoke, is a great partner because he is interested in problems that go to the brain and we work together very closely. So, the, uh, we also have a number of other scientists and surgeons and people that make a living looking at brain MRIs, for example. So when things are difficult, and wow, does it ever get difficult in the brain, 
you know, we call people who look at brain scans for a living, or we have neurosurgeons that only operate on patients that have tumors in their brain, etc. So I think it's a really unique thing. The other two clinics that I know about are one was started in Yale at about the same time, and the other is in Harvard. This gets a little confusing, but... So this is just a family tree, and I'm not even going to show you the details, but this reminds me of... Uh, so, tumors that go to the brain are a little bit like my Uncle Vern. Every time we have a party, at least when I was a kid, Uncle Vern's really weird, and he would go up to the bedroom and spend the party. I have no idea what he did up there, but he would just find a room on his own. Yeah, and I don't want to know. But he was weird, you know, he was odd. He was a great guy, but he wasn't a, he wasn't foresight. So it turns out that the same thing happens in uh, melanoma when it goes to the brain, that there's things that are in common with the melanoma that started in the skin, but there's special things about the tumor in the brain that uh, you can attack with drugs. So along the way, Uncle Vern picks up changes and stops being a high achieving foresight and becomes whatever he is. Uh, but those, you can treat those with drugs. To make these kinds of discoveries, you know, we collect tissue routinely at Moffitt, which is a way that we need your help to help you to make a difference, is to collect tissue so we can do these fancy studies and understand it, because you can make discoveries. So this is again a confusing slide, but one way of, <coughs> it's out of order, Jeez, okay, I'll get back, but, oh yeah, yeah, something happened last night, but it must have been Gasparilla. <laughs> <laughs> Strike that comment. <laughs> but the, uh, so as you can imagine, if you have a tumor somewhere that it, the little tumor cells float in the blood and then they'll lodge in different places like in the brain or lungs or almost anywhere else. We don't really understand exactly how that happens, so let me just annoy you by doing this. So we can collect these little cells now because we have the capacity to do this and, and these happen to be from the brain fluid and uh, identify these cells that are floating through the brain fluid and count them and do some genetic studies to see if we can match what's in the brain exactly, exactly with, what, uh, with a drug or a treatment. And with uh, Dr. Smalley, we can take these little cells now and study them just like they're, just like they're, each cell is like a little person and figure out why patients get resistant to treatment and what is it about the brain environment that supports them. So why does melanoma go to the So I told you that it goes to the brain in about half of patients. It's just an astonishing thing. So we think, again, to make a little joke about it, because it isn't funny, but it's a little bit like my 22-year-old uh, son who's returned from college. I think you like to go home. You return home in times of stress. So he returned after a couple of years. I'm sure many of you have a similar situation. But it turns out that the skin and the brain, uh, when you're just a few cells large, your fetus, they actually, the skin and the brain are derived from exactly the same tissue. So they start from the same thing. Some of the cells from these group of cells go out and become the skin when we, you know, are born, and some of them stay in the brain. So there's common factors that are present in melanoma and the brain. And somehow I think the brain is at least calling or communicating to the melanoma and sending a signal that it can uh, grow in the brain. This is speculation. There's data to support this, though, because it looks like as tumors get uh, resist therapy, they get a little more uh, immature, a little more, and they develop, they go back to having this neuro crest like uh, primitive uh, signature. So the Standard treatment is pretty standard, as you can imagine, that you should only have, this is an MRI scan that shows a lesion, but you should only have surgery as an option, sometimes if we need to make a diagnosis to figure out exactly what it is or what the molecular phenotype might be. Or melanomas in the brain love to bleed for some reason, 
So sometimes if someone has a big lead, it's a life-threatening thing and you sort of need surgery to save your life. There's several kinds of uh, uh, radiation. It's focused stereotactic radiation over, say, five days, and then whole brain radiation. The whole concept that we have is to save the brain. So we don't really want to indiscriminately radiate uh, somebody's, the whole of somebody's brain unless we really, really have to, because these other things are coming along. So as you heard this morning, it's somewhat like, to paraphrase Dickens, it's somewhat the best of times, and it is the worst of times, but it's also the best of times, because we're really on the cutting edge of new treatments. How do we figure out how to use them? What order to use them? And how do we use them safely, particularly in the context of the brain, where, frankly, you, know, you don't really want to make mistakes. So, we all want, if I had brain notes, I'd want what President Carter had, who I understand from the media, I have no inside information is doing well, but he had a combination of one of these immune checkpoint inhibitors that Dr. Kushalani mentioned with radiation. It's not clear yet how to sequence those. Should you get it at the same time as radiation? How long should radiation wait? Again, because sometimes you can get significant uh, complications. We all want to know why he's done so well. Some people think it's because he's a Democrat. <laughs> I'm going to get fired for that. <laughs> but most of us think it's just some, uh, <clears throat> just a couple of examples. <laughs> of, uh, this, so this, this really blows me away because this never happened when I was a kid. So I've been practicing for 20 years, and I remember when we had nothing to offer patients. But now there's tons, there's tons, but there's a lot, a lot of hope. So this is a patient with a big tumor who went on to get one of these targeted therapies that Dr. Smalley talked about. And then after the surgery, this person has shrank and is almost gone, and remained gone for a long time. When I was a kid, Unfortunately, patients with melanoma who went to the brain only lived a couple months. That's not true anymore. When I was a resident and first saw patients who had HIV, for example, they also lived a couple months. And now, Magic Johnson is the best example. People live for decades. So I think it's the same kind of revolution, which is why I'm involved in this, is because I want to be part of the revolution. So the remarkable thing, which I forgot to tell you completely, the major point of this is that surprisingly that these drugs look like they work as well in the brain as they do in the rest of the body so far. It's remarkable. And because you can have a lot of complications, you know, we have to be very careful, and we've been cautious in adopting this, but that is unbelievable that that happened. The other point about this is the things that Dr. Smalley was telling you about using combination treatment. I don't, I don't think he really told you this, but he made that discovery. So it's actually because of him that people are getting BRAF inhibitors with MEK, which, I mean, he figured out why some patients fail with BRAF alone, and with these MEK inhibitors they do a lot. I mean, that's him, actually. So of course we're doing everything possible to work with him. The days of using immunotherapy that I'm just going to talk about for a minute, because I'm almost done talking is we don't really have much data, but again, with some of these checkpoint inhibitors, people respond about as commonly in the brain as they do outside the brain. So maybe it's 15%, maybe if you add a kind of chemotherapy that's not available in uh, the U.S., it's higher. There's a number of other studies that use these, some in combination, uh, to determine if the benefit is worth the risk from some of these, because the risk can be significant. So this is just a patient who uh, had a whole bunch of, probably has about 30 little tumors in his head, so it's an MRI, the little white spots are the tumors. If you want, you can count them, and it's sort of this scan here, just to show you as you move through his head, he has all these problems, it's heartbreaking. But here, just to show one slide, uh, without talking about what he received, just after one treatment, 
They had this unbelievable, unbelievable shrinkage. Which I said and told him as he reminded me yesterday that it was freaking awesome. And, and a, a miracle. So this is like uh, shooting an arrow at Achilles' heel. Whether this is going to be enough to help people or not, we don't know. Right? But, it, but at least the enemy has shown weakness in the brain. So we're almost done. In the, it's just another example of combining a patient that has a couple little areas rather than giving whole brain radiation, because of course we want our brains to be normal and you only use whole brain when we need it, that combined with this with the lumumab, that these things go away with radiation. Oops, so. Now, the part that I haven't told you that I think is really important, because this is kind of the last slide, is that the side effects of many of these drugs are uh, very serious, so about half the patients can have life-threatening complications, and occasionally these are fatal or very serious. So, in spite of the excitement, we have to balance this carefully with the side effects that I suspect are artificial learning probably. Did you mention that? Yeah, I've heard that before. Just a couple things. So, we think we have the right group of people here to make a difference in this disease and the, the melanoma that goes to the brain, and I think the time is right. We have a lot of passion to do this because we really want to make a difference. Uh, we'd ask, we don't know how to combine these. And because there's so few patients on clinical trials, it's not clear what the right answers are, so you have to get away from just opinion. But we need your help to have a clinical trial available as well as we routinely collect tissue through you know, this ethically approved way to do it. But what we're looking for is to see if we can personalize the medicine to you, not just when things start, but if your tumor changes or you change and it works to be resistant. We really want to save the brain. So the final thing is just to, uh, which again, the thing with feathers, which I find, we have hope. And I just, I love this quote, but I'm not going to read the whole thing, but so the idea is that hope is a thing with, it's like a little bird. Uh, what is it? And sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chilliest land and on the strangest sea, yet never has it asked a crumb from me. So let's work together and hope to make a difference. Thank you very much.